According to the federal rules of civil procedure, among the other things, or actually the federal rules of evidence, among the other things for consideration is evidence, and when it qualifies or is accepted out of a consideration of hearsay. One of the things that is to be considered has to do with state of mind, including state of mind upon revelation of information. For instance, you're exposed to something and there's a shock, and in the course of being exposed to this shock, you react, and this goes to a determination or a demonstration of state of mind when it comes to, among other things, the capacity for one to comprehend information and understand the context in which, if it's a crime, the crime is occurring. It's also about being able to identify things and factors in the environment and in the course of what is ongoing to be able to determine whether or not you are cognizant of understanding the circumstances. There's a variety of reasons why state of mind upon an initial encounter or reaction would be considered not only evidentiary in and of itself, but could also go toward uh, addressing other potentially disputed facts related to the case and how they would be considered in accordance with the proceeding. I've just opened up Lewis and Fidelity and Deposit Company of Maryland argued on May 4th, 1934, and decided on June 4th, 1934, regarding a situation in the state of Georgia where there was a, uh, a depository um, holding of state funds declared to be insolvent um, after a personal bond had been given and it had been put into receivership. And not only had it been put into receivership, but that at some point the original receiver had been substituted for another. I'm going to read, and this is my initial reaction, the court, following Portoff versus El Paso Hudspeth County's Road District 62F 2D 498, ruled as a matter of federal law that national banks had under National Bank Act, as enacted in 1864, power to pledge assets to secure public deposits. It ruled as matter of state law that the lien is a contractual one arising, not proprio vigore, by reason of the statutes but by contract of the bank as an incident of giving a personal bond. That these statutes apply to both state and national banks and the scope of the lien is the same in respect to both. Declared in describing its character that from the date of the bond, the lien attaches to all property real and personal then owned or thereafter acquired. That a grantee of real estate having constructive notice would take subject to the lien, etc. It's the first thing that needs to be understood. Contract state of mind, intent upon engagement, who is the contractor, who is the contractee, and if one is anticipated at the onset to be eligible in consideration of substitution, i.e., at the onset of the contract, was it understood that there were to be determinations regarding the roles of the contractor and the contractee? And that someone other than the individual and person signing at that time would be positioned to then be required to honor the obligation. Was the contract with the individual based on the personal bond? Or was it with the position? Was it with the office? And hence the understanding was that the person was in a representative role and had qualifications based upon performance of the office as opposed to considerations of personal bond. This is very important because when we're discussing matters related to outstanding obligations, one of the things this specifically discusses is the fact that somebody attempted to move forward on the case with an understanding they had a pre-existing claim that they had a entitlement to exercise a lien over assets acquired later because they had a claim that predated certain claims that came up in consideration of the process by which it was put into receivership. Well, then we're going to have to talk about concepts of assets and considerations of assets in regards to constitutional considerations and then, if necessary, discuss the Constitution itself as a form of contract, including a contract that is entered into in a particular manner 
by those that have to swear an oath to uphold it in performance of their office, which is itself engaged by individuals merely in a representative role of others. This is very important. This is a very important distinction. This is my state of mind at this time. I may read the rest of this, but this is enough for now because we never usually get past this point because you refuse to disclose who you are. And my experience has been the reason you refuse to disclose who you are is because you're not who you're trying to compel me to accept you as being. You have no constitutional authority and you are abusing pretenses of constitutional coverage in order to try to get me to agree to cede to somebody that is an undeclared and attempted for ambiguous enemy of the state, including state of my mind. And I'm not accepting it. 